Siemens a couple of years ago, and um, it's just about coming through that that's affecting what we do. But I've used the Siemens template here just because last week I was talking in Berlin at the PLM Europe event, and so I've reused a large amount of what I had there, and so it was in a template that was easy for me to use. So I want to talk about what we've done over the last seven years to build on OSLC for federated data. And we mentor, we started doing this, like I said, seven years ago, because we were concerned that we were not seeing solutions of integrating between all those little different points of view and all those little different silos people have and all those different ways of thinking about information. So I want to talk a little <coughs> bit about collaboration, about federated data, and about what we did about that. Linked data and OSLC being what we did about that. And we built a tool, and we call it Context SDM. And Context turned out to be rather an appropriate name, because the problem we're dealing with is putting information in context so that it is useful and available and productive to the people who are trying to make something of it. And if I can figure out which button does something useful here, something is interrupting me all the time, and that's what's happening. Go away, Larry. There we go. And it seems to be that we're all chasing after trying to get something collaborating, and as Peter was just saying, we're, we need to do something now not sometime in the future, but everyone's too busy pushing the cart to actually look back and say, we could be doing this a better way. And we all think that we're dealing with the problem, but we're really not actually communicating. We're talking, and again, as was commented, across different domains, different disciplines, different points of view, different terminology, different spoken languages for that matter. Now, I tend to think about things from a systems engineering point of view. It was contended earlier on that we don't have system architects. I would somewhat disagree with that in the general case, although it may well be true in the case of the specifics that you were trying to address here. Um, I belong to an organization called INCOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering. In fact, I am the CIO and a member of the board of directors of INCOSI. And in that space, I like to think that what I've been doing for the last 45 years is systems engineering. It's all about worrying about the big system. And that big system is not in any one silo. It's not in any one discipline. And it is unusual that you find people who can effectively today span all those disciplines because the complexity is crazy. The terminology we use is different. The way we go about things is very difficult. 45 years ago, I was a design engineer working for a company developing sonar systems. I had a digital twin. I had a digital twin of the sea because we were looking at how do I model the way in which sound propagates through water so I understand how I'm going to interpret that with my electronics. I had a digital twin for my electronics before I built it so that I could simulate what kind of filtering did I need to have in my signals and how was I going to process those things. And I look at what people do today and they do exactly the same things. But I could deal with that in my head at the time because the problem space was fairly contained. We could understand what was going on. We could see the scope of the thing. A team this big would have been surprisingly big for what we needed to be able to do, to be able to resolve the problems and build the systems we were building then. A team this big today is a tiny team by comparison with what we typically deal with. So we're dealing with all sorts of things in all sorts of separate spaces, as several people have said. Axel was kind enough as to give me this picture for use a year or so ago, and I keep reusing it because we're trying to deal with the things people need to do. We're trying to deal with distributed data, and we need something in the middle that helps us to deal with that. And that something in the middle partly is fulfilled by OSLC. OSLC is open. It means many people can use it. It's not IBM's. It's ours. It's all of us. It's providing services. Services have got more and more buzzy words recently, and we hear about microservices instead of services and so on. But reality says, I'm going to break down something I might have built in, and I'm going to turn that into something I can go and fetch when I need it, and use it when I need it. <coughs> and if I break down what I had then and break that into smaller pieces, now they're called microservices. But in reality, I'm just breaking down some way of doing something into something I can reuse and reapply as I go through my sequence of activities. And OSLC offers us some of those services, but we need some more. 
It's all about life cycle. So although we can use and we do use OSLC to help us to do synchronization, moving data when we need to, to solve that piece of the problem, it's really all about knowing where the data is, when was it put there, is it related to this other data, is it up to date, is it out of date, how do I go find out what to do about it. It's about its life cycle more than it's about the data itself. And it's about collaborating across that life cycle between all those people who speak different things, who do different stuff, who understand different terminologies, different processes. How do I life cycle manage software or hardware, as we were just hearing from Stephen and so on. So OSLC, we've seen the picture before. It set out to work like this. And for all the reasons we talked about, we decided that we needed something in the middle. We didn't want to talk tool to tool. We wanted to talk tool to focal point, tool to hub in the middle. And I often say this is just like the cell phones we've all got. I've got a cell phone, you've got a cell phone. We can talk to each other. Well, no, my cell phone has no idea about your cell phone. But it does know about the carrier that acts as a focal point for me. And there might not be one focal point in a real world. There might be multiple focal points that know how to talk to each other, that know how to bridge domains that know how to bridge the supply chain, that know how to deal with all those other fun barricades that we're dealing with in our process. But that focal point helps me do a whole lot. It helps my cell phone know whether I'm sending a text or viewing a movie or making an actual phone call, perhaps. So it does a job in the middle. And it helps to deal with the fact that there are many different network protocols. There are many different ways of sharing information. There are many different video formats. Whatever they might be, it delivers to me something I can use in the context of my need for that particular piece of information. That's what we've got to do with OSLC. We've got to enable in the middle the ability to deal with the information in the way I can consume it. I don't care if Axel wants it in a different way. I want it my way because my job means I need that information. I need to interpret it so I can use it. So we've got this thing in the middle. And the premise says, for any tool that's out there, Peter's, yes, we're using the tools today, that we have today, I want to make those tools able to play in this party. Well, I've got to go back to the MathWorks and beat them over the head until they change the tool. No, we fixed the MathWorks tools. We gave the MathWorks MATLAB, Simulink, and Adapter. And a little while later, I got a phone call from Jim Tung, who was the CTO of MathWorks, and says, can we have a demo? I'd like to see what you did. Good tools, professional tools in our industry, typically have great APIs. We've talked about APIs today. They have APIs that let you extend the tool, that let you access that tool and interface with it, so we can use those APIs. So if a tool has an OSLC part of the connection, I'll use it. If it doesn't, I'll augment it. Actually, I'll augment it anyway because I want more than just OSLC. So what we took to a premise here is throughout the life cycle of all the stuff people are doing, whatever representation of life cycles you like, the V diagram pops up in lots of people's spaces, I've got all sorts of different tools I'm using through that life cycle. I'm not about to go and throw out all those tools I'm using today just because you told me you've got a WYSI communication technology. So I've got to make my WYSI communication technology play with those tools plug into those tools. And I'm not going to change those tools, nor am I going to change those tools' data to do this. So my <coughs> focal point has to do a whole bunch of stuff. It has to manage the communication. It has to understand what it's seeing when it gets information. It has to relate that information to the context in which we are. It has to understand how to map that information to the information that somebody else can use when they're trying to do their jobs in their part of the process. It has to remember all that. So my links, just to jump on a particular point that's been raised several times here, live in that box in the middle. There are no links in the peripheral tools. In fact, none of those tools even know that the links exist. None of those tools even know that I put a plugin into those tools. In most cases, tools are not even aware of the fact I've used their API. Some are, but most aren't. However, the user of those tools is aware of that and is able to see that and is able to utilize that. Well, how the heck does that work? There's no links indoors. 
No, we don't put any links in any, any source authoring tool because that authoring tool, as Stephen was busily telling us, might have versioned data. And if I go and touch that data, it's broken. Kaboom, ripple, 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 all the way up the tree. Everything changed because I touched the data to say that I'm linking to it. Can't do that. Some, some places you can do that, most of the time you can't do that. So we took the premise, I'm not going to touch the source data. If somebody sitting using one of those tools chooses to point to a piece of data, the API can tell me that piece of data has been selected. The API can then talk to my central point and say, has anything been associated with this piece of information ever? This component inside a file that PLM systems don't know about as components, or whatever it might be. So if I select an object in, let's say, a SysML diagram, then the API can tell me that the user of the tool selected that object. I can go back and ask my central point via my communication mechanism, here's an object that's currently selected. Do you know anything about this object? Oh yes, it's connected to all these other things. Its last remembered version was this. And I've got links in there that tell me all that thing. Oh, by the way, all these links are versioned. And all these links are visible for their entire history. So I can wind the clock back for any given piece of information and find out all its history. When was it created? When was it changed? What versions has it gone through in its life? What was it associated with at any point in its history? And relate that information. Because in the middle there, I'm keeping a whole bunch of links. No original data, just metadata, just information about the data so I know where it is and where it was. Now, that's not quite true, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, but I don't want to spend too long on that. But the objective here, just like I said with my cell phone, I, as whoever I might be, whatever role I have, want my stuff for me in my look and feel so I can interact with it the way I want to. Now, that means some of that data is in a form I don't comprehend, but I want information <coughs> about it that is meaningful to me. I may not comprehend somebody else's JSON code. I personally don't comprehend JSON code. It was not the kind of code that was around when I was writing code. But I might want to know where it is. I want, might want to know who wrote it, when did they write it, what part of the system does it belong to, what does it interact with. All those kind of things are useful for me to know. I'd like to know that kind of stuff. So I, whatever my role might be, need to know stuff in my terminology. So we, yes, Andrew. But how does this central, mega central architecture fit in the view that you just described that users want fundamentally different views of information? Is it actually possible to have one central piece uh, to provide so many uh, tailored views? Let's have a look at that as we go on forward, if you don't mind. All right. And if you don't like my answer by the time we get to the end, I'll tell you what I think we need to do to get there from here. Because it's a good question. And the answer is probably no. So we set out to love linked data. And our understanding of that linked data is in terms of metadata. And we follow rigorously Dublin Core that says this is what metadata definitions are. And we like RDF because it helps us to understand what it is we're seeing and how things belong to each other, and so on. We decided that we need to integrate with the places that data comes from, authoring tools. So it's all about tool integrations as far as we're concerned. We decided that people need different ways of looking at this. So it's sort of kind of to Andrew's question, if I'm an iPhone user, I want to see it on my iPhone in a form that's useful to me on an iPhone. If, on the other hand, I'm a Catia user, I want a huge big screen with tons of detail on it. It doesn't work very well on my iPhone. And in between those two, there's all sorts of other representations and information people want to have and want to be able to do. I want multiple user interfaces. And in fact, if I'm a Catia user, I want to see my requirements from Catia. I don't want to go and see if I can figure out which requirement tool the team used this week. And are my requirements in Doors Next, or are they in Jama, or whatever the heck they might be. I want the system to know that for me. Just, just show me the requirement I'm supposed to be working on. 
I don't need to know where it is, and show it to me in a form that gives me the information I can usefully employ. And we can work down those paths. And it needs to be now, <coughs> not tomorrow when somebody updates the PLM system or whenever the refresh happens. It needs to be what matters to me right now, because that's how we are today. We've been trained that right now is now. And so we need to behave in a way that delivers that. And so there were comments earlier on about performance. This has got to be performant. If I have to sit and wait 15 minutes for a query to happen, I'm going to give up after about 20 seconds, not 15 minutes. Our patience has become shrunk by the world in which we now live. We've been trained by the gadgets we have in our life. So there's various places out there I can get data. There are some places, <coughs> like I'll pick on IBM, Doors Next, and Team Concert and other things like that, that support an OSLC communication, that in fact know how to talk to each other. Because they live in a land where they understand definitions, and those definitions conform to the standards I like, and that's very nice. But then I've got one of those tools, and I've got one of Mentor Graphics authoring tools. Capital is our cable and wire harness tool that's used to describe the cables and wires in cars or airplanes or whatever else it might be. It has no idea about OSLC. In fact, it has no idea about any other domain or discipline whatsoever. We do cabling. We don't need no stinking requirements. Somebody will give us a design spec in a big pile of paper and we'll work through that and we'll draw up all the wires. And then at the end of the day, we'll spit out a form board and we'll make a wiring harness. You don't need no stinking any other system. Oh, actually we do. Because our cables have to fit inside that aeroplane or car. And the aeroplane has been designed in Katia or NX or whatever it might be. So I need a relationship with a mechanical CAD tool. So we have to have a close data relationship in that space. But I actually do care about the requirements and the specifications and all the other factors that I'm being told to work to. So I need a way to talk to those. So these are typically desktop tools. Not only do they not know anything about anybody else's information, but they live in their own little data world. They've got their own little databases. They've got their own way of storing stuff in a file system or something. I don't maybe know what that system is. And their data is in some arcane format that isn't XML or anything else I can read from any other tool. So I'm not going to talk about data. So we said, okay, fine, we fix this. We stick into those tools a plugin that extends the tool. It gives the tool several things. It gives it an OSLC communication. It gives it, therefore, the ability to use OSLC services like a preview that we heard about. I can go and get one of those previews through OSLC. And I can even just, through the links, point straight to where that preview comes from and have it come to me. And we put in this other thing into the process that stores all the relationships I might need to know. So if I want to know where something is, I can ask this store, where's the information? Where else do I have to go to look for something? How do I get that something? And maybe, how do you render that something to me in a different way than the source tool? But most of the time, I'm going to go back through the standard interfaces and ask OSLC to deliver me something that I can utilize. So we built a plugin that does three things. The OSLC bit in the middle here is the communication piece of it. And if it exists in the tool, we'll use it. And if it doesn't, our plugin will provide it. But we also want the user of this tool, capital <coughs> or Katia or whatever it is, to stay sitting there in that tool. Full screen, don't have to leave your working session, carry on doing what you know how to do, but extend that user interface a wee bit. So in one of the palettes or whatever it is that your user interface offers you, I've got something I can point to that says, find me a new requirement. I know there's some new requirements about this, I need to see it. Or show me that new task that I just got an IM about. Or let me connect what I'm working on to the bill of materials that that belongs to, or whatever it might be. The user needs to do a bunch of stuff. So within the scope, and in, this is a tiny fragment out of Mentor Capital, it's got a palette which has tabs in it. We just add one more tab. It's exactly the same environment the user is used to, but in that one more tab, there's access to a wider world that they can do things with. And then the final thing we do is we look at the data that that tool has. We 
effectively would like to do this through an OSLC query. I would like to be able to point to a tool, any random tool that came out of the woodwork, and say, tell me the data shapes that you have. Give me your ontology. And I will suck it right in and integrate it into my central point, and now I know you. Unfortunately, tools don't do that yet. But I think we will look forward to a place where that happens. So we write up an ontology for each of these plugins that says, I know what's in that tool. I know that Capital has cables and wires and harnesses and all these other things. Or I look at a SysML tool and I know all the objects that SysML defines that are in that tool. And I look at Magic Draw versus Rhapsody and I know that they actually represent those things differently. So I need to understand what it is I've got handled when I grab something. So we put a little bit something in there that says, I want to know what kind of tools information is available to me and being presented to me and what useful metadata about that there is that I can then know about in the future, link to when I need to go back and find it. And that sounds very nice and handy until I discover that not all tools share data in quite the same way, but I will come back to that. I won't be too much longer. I don't know how I'm going time. So in the tool we want to expose services and <coughs> tool, like I said, this is my mentor graphics capital again, I'll keep using it. It doesn't know that it's connected. All it knows is another plugin was dropped in. It doesn't know what that plugin does. But that plugin is the user, the user interface. And the user can say, I would like to add a new requirement. I would like to go and select that requirement from doors 9.6. Or doors next, or whatever it might be that I want to go and get. And the user then gets served up whatever that tool provides through its OSLC integration that I can use. Doors 9. I can go and ask it, well, with a little bit of help from other bits of Doors infrastructure, I can go and ask it to show me a selector dialog. And it will show me how to select stuff from that tool. So I get a selection box. And that's served up to me by that tool. I have no knowledge of that from my point of view in my context tool. I just know we said to Doors, can you offer us the selector? Because this user would like to select your requirement. The user's got the ability to interact with that as if they had gone and logged into doors and opened up doors and asked doors, I'm looking for a requirement, give me the selector. It's exactly provided by that tool in that example in that way. Nothing I did to change it. And I can utilize that. Now, doors 9 is not actually a very good example because doors 9 doesn't really know about OSLC at all. You have to go through some foolishness to get there. But let's pretend I was giving you some other tool that was a bit smarter than that. I just happen to have this screenshot around. So once I've made my selection, the user can use that information. It's delivered to my capital customer as a delegated user interface. You can see the screenshots also are behind there somewhere. Didn't bring a demo with me. My laptop wrapped out, and I've got this junky little one. And if I look at some tool that actually does know how to do a proper preview, this is what Rational Team Concert presented as a preview on the day I took the screenshot. It's evolved a little bit since the time I took this picture too. And so in any case, whatever it is, it delivers information to the user in the place they're sitting without them having to know, to know how to work the tool at the other end beyond the limited interface it presents. Now, if there was a login required, that's respected. I didn't show you a login process here. But if I have to do a login because we don't have a single sign-on system across systems, however that might be, one day somebody will figure that one out properly too. And we do have some services available in OSLC to let me use sign-on if it's accepted by the recipient system at the other end. Not every system knows that. But we respect those communications just like OSLC let me do that. And then we understand that data. And the way we built this thing, we built a meta model, and this comes back to what do I understand here? There's a foundation, quite a big chunk of stuff that says these are all the, the things we know how to do with our metadata. There's going to be layers for every application, and it's a badly drawn picture. I ought to have lots of little slices in here. Because each application is going to have its own little slice in the picture that says this is specific to Rhapsody this is specific to Katia, or this is specific to whatever it might be out there. And then, there's going to be application layers on top of that, 
that specifically say for a particular process, ISO 26262 was mentioned earlier today, I've got a process to follow. If I do this thing, then here's the consequential actions that relate to that. We know the process, we could build that into a template. And then, of course, the way Scheffler does stuff is not quite the same way as Daimler does stuff. <coughs> so there's going to be the Scheffler view of things or the Daimler view of things or whomever else might be in that example there. I've forgotten already. Conti. And so everyone's going to have their own points of view. I want it to look my way. And we know that we all have to have custom versions of everything. But it's built into that meta model. And this meta model is completely dynamic. And if you have a new tool and plug it in, you can load up its meta model. Or, as I su suggested, at some point in the future, a new tool can be plugged in. And it will tell me what its shapes look like, what its ontology is. And I can just pull that straight in, and it becomes part of the meta model. But we're not quite there yet. So a quick example of where this <coughs> applies to something. I'm going to do that ISO 26262 example. There's links to information. There's derived information from that. I've called it requirements derived from the specification. You might also have requirements. But there are requirements derived from specifications. There's a process we have to follow. And there are levels in the process. For example, ISO 26262, it's called an ASIL. A -S -I -L. And then there's requirements based upon that. If this thing is a SIL B, then I've got to do all this set of validations and tests on it. Well, that's part of the template. We know about those things. So for each of these processes, there are specified things you must do, functionality you must support, capabilities that must be there. Because one day, the auditor will expect you to prove that. And that's where traceability is critical. I was talking to somebody earlier today, and the customer says, we tried to link this to this, and OSLC didn't work, so we're going to hire five more students, and they're going to cut and paste out of PDF files. <laughs> Traceability, auditor, no, your car is not going on the road. Don't think that's really workable. So we have to solve those kind of problems. We have to satisfy the processes that are there. We have to give you the ability to track what the process says you have to do. We have to give you the ability to look at that information in whatever traceability rendering people are going to come up with that says, I want to see all that stuff. These diagrams look lovely for demos, but they're terrible if you've got 100,000 items in the diagram. But they're great if you can narrow that down again and say, I only really care about the functional safety of the ACC system in this particular hazard situation. Show me the tests. Perfect. I can trace that, I can see that, instead of let's all go dig through those PDF files and see if we can find where somebody documented what was going on. So we're trying to pr improve overall efficiency. And with the way we went to do this, we said we need communication. OSLC came up during the lifetime of the work we were doing on this as being a good foundational communication capability that lets me improve the efficiency of the process. And the goal is to link stuff together so we know where it is, where it came from, why is it there, what's it for, and use it in the places people want to. Siemens will speak. Digital thread. It really is, though, about the digital thread. It's the thread of information, the continuity of all those things, what touches what. And as we move on forward under the Siemens umbrella, we're expanding our process into the digital thread, the processes people have to follow the user experiences people want to have. And that user experience might be something that's represented by a data management system, but it might be something that I'm sitting in Katia all day, every day. I want it to feel a lot like Katia, thank you very much, or whatever it might be. I should say NX every time, not Katia. I must <laughs> fix my head. So we're moving down the path of providing continuing growth in this area. I would love to be able to come back to the example Peter Prostek put together just earlier for us and say, I would like to participate. I'm not ready yet to do that. But we will be in the early part of next year. And we would love to come join you in that activity. We're not quite there yet. I wouldn't be able to su su supply you something that would be robust enough for your solutions. But I have been supplying this technology for the last five years to companies under the umbrella of my context 
product and it's being widely used to help people deal with these kinds of problems. We didn't really want to push it out broadly. We focused very carefully on a few people to help us understand this technology, <coughs> see where it goes, see what we can do with it, figure out what the use cases were. We found a few use cases. I spent some time with Wesley describing some of those use cases, which is why he mentioned it earlier on today. And you saw Mark Schulte's use case also referenced the same kind of concept we're talking about. So I believe OSLC is hugely valuable in this space, and I want to keep on making it more valuable. But I believe that we have to do something on top of OSLC to make it useful, to make it easy, to make it possible for people to pick it up and use it. I don't want Schaeffler and Ericsson and Siemens and everyone to try and figure out how the hell this stupid technology works. I want them to use it. I'm done. Bill, I thought you had a video for us. I, I did, but I didn't put it up. Oh, okay. I could, okay. but it'll be painfully slow because okay. this laptop is miserable. Okay. I'm sorry to say. So, I, if you don't mind, I won't. But I can easily point you to where you can see those videos online. Right. Okay. You should include it with the with all the. I will include it in the output the afterwards video. as to what you can go and see. Probably it better to watch it offline. Yeah. Absolutely, it's much better to watch these things offline. Well, how, how does it scale? How does it scale? Yeah, I mean, uh, how well does it scale? Do you have any benchmarks? By which you mean, what if I throw a thousand <coughs> users at it? 